so we all seem to have arrived. Uh, moderator candidates, welcome all of you and audience to the uh, at-large city council debate with seven candidates here tonight. Uh, my name is Valerie Nelson, um, and I'm on the board of the Lanesville Community Center. Uh, you're sitting in this uh, building that was, uh, we were organized in 1954. It was an old dairy farm, and it's um, our great neighborhood center, so welcome all. On June 4th, uh, here in the center, we had a community forum on issues of concern to the neighborhood. And the cost of housing just was front and center for whether our neighborhood will be the same given trends in um, you know, scale and price and community character. So what you can find are some of the background materials that we use for that form out on the table if they have some housing production plan data about the aging of the population and lack of affordability, that interesting data in the city's plan you can take as whether well other materials that we used. So we uh, decided that it would be particularly useful for us and really for the whole city to focus one debate on the question of housing and we're very delighted to have all you candidates here. Um, so what I want to add also is um, one note. Uh, there was a little bit of discussion today about given the fact that the Fuller School project will be voted on by um, city councilors after the election is it um, under open meeting law allowed to have anyone, either in the audience or up here, mention the Fuller School project? Uh, and I did talk to the Attorney General's office um, this afternoon and was informed that during an election, uh, it's quite all right, even if there's a quorum of you, to discuss your views on the Fuller School project. The advice was, <laughs> please address your comments on this project to the audience rather than to each other, because if you start discussing up here what you're planning to do together, that is a violation of the open meeting law. So uh, now we're also, I would say, is that in our own discussions, there's a very broad spectrum of solutions that could emerge, and the Fuller School is just one project, so it's not necessarily on the highest of our priorities e either, but please feel free um, under the <coughs> Attorney General's guidance that you may uh, mention that project. So now I would like to introduce our moderator, Judith Olson, who is another Lanesville Community Center board member, and she'll take over for the rest of the evening here. And again, thank you very much. Declare a quorum. Yes, so Joe would like to make one announcement. On advice of uh, our council, that I uh, declare a quorum of the I city do. council that's present here tonight. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, just like to share our process that Val has worked out. Uh, this is really not a debate, this is more of a community listening session. And each of the candidates have been asked to speak for five minutes on the following two questions What is your personal perspective on housing? And what are you observing as trends in housing in the city? <coughs> Secondly, would you support a more proactive approach to protecting housing options for the diversity of Gloucester residents and neighborhoods? And what are some of your thoughts on particular measures that might deserve further study and engagement? Uh, they will each respond to those questions for five minutes. You will then, as a community uh, citizens, have an opportunity to share your questions, comments, ideas, and they'll be listening to you for about 40 minutes, and then they will have an opportunity to give a three-minute wrap-up, uh, and they will obviously choose in three minutes what they will respond to. Uh, so we'll start with the five-minute, uh, and I think we'll, yes? Uh, at, when there are 30 seconds left, we, first of all, I'll, I'll raise that hand. Thank you. And Damien is our timekeeper. So thank you, Damien. All right. So let's start uh, with the five minute statements uh, here. And when we close, we'll start on that end and come back. Okay, right. Jim. Oh, please introduce yourself uh, before you start. Hi, uh, I'm Jen Holmgren, and uh, I really appreciate uh, the chance to be able to speak up here with my fellow candidates. And uh, my personal perspective uh, and what I'm observing as trends in housing in the city uh, are pretty big. Um, my husband Terry and I are homeowners, 
And we're fortunate, depending on how you look at it, because we <coughs> unfortunately inherited a home from his parents because they passed away. Uh, so we inherited his childhood home in Bayview. Uh, so we sort of became homeowners by, by way of that, which is oftentimes the story in Gloucester. Uh, and the same thing happened with my great aunt Viola Ray, who lived right at 1133 Washington Street uh, here in Lanesville in a house that was built by one of the Babson family members. Uh, Viola grew up here in Lanesville with her five brothers, her mother and her father, and the house was hers uh, through an inheritance until she donated it to the Lutheran Church, which is our family's church, uh, when she passed away about 10 years ago. So passing property down from generation to generation uh, is how families have handled it for years here in Gloucester, but it isn't sustainable for a variety of reasons. Uh, the number one reason, I believe, is jobs. Gloucester and Cape Ann must continue to foster the existing industries that we have here and the businesses and to welcome 21st century businesses here. I'm excited to see what the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute uh, has to offer for our community <coughs> as it continues to grow. Uh, we have applied materials, we have BOMCO, and we even have the new Happy Valley uh, Medical Marijuana Distribution Center, which is slated to create 97 new jobs for our city. So uh, however you feel about that particular issue, that's, that's jobs. Uh, another big reason is our aging population, and I've looked at the numbers from the city's housing production plan and the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, and it's no big secret that residents over age 60 will make up 58% of Gloucester's population by 2030. And as a visiting nurse, I understand the desire to age in place and I empathize with it. But sometimes it is not possible to stay at home. Maintaining a large old house like my aunt buys is very expensive for one person. And since we have fewer job options here on the island, kids are forced to look up the line for work and housing so they aren't readily available to help their parents necessarily. People will also need accommodations uh, if they develop health issues. As a visiting nurse, I work with seniors all the time who are on waiting lists to get into housing, and that process can take years. And finally, the cost of housing is a big issue. When we bought our house in West Gloucester three years ago, it cost about as much as the neighborhood pumps did. <coughs> and we made a few improvements to it, and while we did, the real estate market here exploded again. And I'm gonna kinda spitball it and say that we could probably sell it for about $75,000 over what we paid for it, which is nice for us, but it means the market for selling and renting is getting higher all around and becoming further and further out of reach for the people who grew up here. Our housing needs are changing as we move into the future. And as a parent of a child who attends Gloucester Public School, <coughs> I've seen her make friends with my friends' kids that I went to school with when I graduated from Gloucester High School. Uh, unfortunately, I've also had friends from high school, uh, hard-working friends who put their pants on one leg at a time like everybody else, who have needed to seek housing elsewhere uh, related to cost, and I've seen them move to Beverly. I had one friend recently looking for an apartment in Raynham, which was just so depressing. Uh, so we'd love for our daughter to live here when she grows up, if she chooses, and <coughs> we'd love for her friends to be able to live here too. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. This is a great turnout here in Lanesville, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Valerie, for framing a couple of questions that are really important that really we haven't had the opportunity to, um, to address in, in depth. Um, actually, um, the whole question of housing, affordable housing, and our housing production plan are key to our um, quality of life and the future of our community. Um, when we think about what our community is, it is a place to live and it is a place to work. And hopefully those two things go together. One of the things I wanted to just uh, briefly introduce um, is um, we've done many studies in this city about uh, housing and how to uh, approach it. And I think it's kind of interesting to re refer back to the Plan 2000, which was a, uh, a, a massive community-oriented uh, um, assessment of Gloucester. Um, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with it or, or have read it. Um, but rereading it today is kind of interesting in light of the issues that we face about housing. 
This is right from the, um, from the report. Unless measures are taken to protect or increase the supply of moderately priced housing, the market will gradually reduce choices for many Gloucester residents as those who can pay more steadily outbid those of lesser means, resulting in displacement at the moderate and lower end of the income spectrum. There is a real danger that unless the supply of housing that working families can afford is increased, people who are raised and work here will no longer be able to afford to live here. The people being squeezed out are workers in the schools, city services, fishermen, and artists who have all traditionally been a part of our community. Business, city government, and the public schools report that selected candidates do not take jobs or do not stay because they cannot find housing in this community. And the report goes on to say the antidote is expansion of opportunities for many market segments simultaneously, gradually reducing pressure and, and opening new options. What a great idea. <laughs> the question for all of us uh, sitting here, not just us who are running for office, is how do we do that? That is a very complicated question. Um, one thing I did want to point out, because we're in Lanesville, is the notion of workforce housing. You know, we are sitting in the middle of the original workforce housing um, locale on Cape Ann, and if you look, you can still see it, you know, up on, on High Street, over on Emerald Street, on South Kilby you'll, and Sequoia Street, you'll see the housing that was built for the quarry workers, these wonderful bungalow housing, some uh, multifamily housing, but it's all there. And that's a, that was a model that worked back then. That, that meant that for those workers, they had affordable housing where they were working. <clears throat> of course, it was in the company's interest too, but we don't need to go into that tonight. Um, the point is that that's a, that was a great model then, but that's not a sustainable model now because what has interfered with that, models like that is the, is the marketplace. And when you ask about uh, my personal observations, one of the observations I've had from being on the city council is the paradox that we have of rising property values, which automatically raise your property taxes because the taxes are based on the value of your house. And every year the assessor, you know, applies the formula and up goes your property value and up goes your uh, taxes. And that puts that burden, that, and that's a burden that, that for those of us who are in city government is a very difficult one to deal with because those revenues, of course, are ones that we need to run the city. But it starts to put the squeeze on the, uh, on the housing choices that we have. So what, what are we going to do about that? Uh, the other uh, um, uh, um, observation I have of the current situation is the fact that people can buy houses and that are, um, you know, teardowns and build something new on there, and they can build them in accordance with the zoning, um, the zoning ordinance as it exists today. Mostly they can do a lot by right. Some of it has to be done by, um, by going to the Zoning Board of Appeals. But the point is that, that old housing stock is, being dis is, is disappearing and new housing stock is appearing, which is not a bad thing in and of itself. The question is, how and how can the city have input to control that so that it is measured and that it doesn't um, continue to adversely impact the, um, the uh, value of our housing? So um, I, have, was on the city, I was the city council rep on the housing production plan. Um, there is a lot in that plan of strategies, of actual strategies that will work, and those are the kind of things that I will be working on on the city council if I'm reelected. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. My name is Joe Shalino. I'm currently uh, City Council President. I have served as Chair of, uh, of uh, the Planning uh, uh, Board, and uh, i am also uh, uh, been served many terms as, uh, as a member of the Board. So uh, I'm quite aware and, of, uh, of uh, our zoning issues, and, and I just want to go over a couple things uh, on the questions that, uh, that were asked. And uh, the first question we were asked is, what is your personal perspective and what are you observing as trends in the housing in the city? And I don't think it's just Joe. I think you can find that we're seeing that, as Paul was saying, a lot of people are buying older homes and tearing it down and, and building bigger homes. And, 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 and I've never in all my years as a city council have been approached by so many people that cannot find affordable workforce housing. I have heard more stories, you know, at, uh, at my store about people who 
have relatives that can't find an apartment, that are sleeping on couches, and who's sleeping in a sleeping bag on the floor. We really have a critical situation here when it comes to uh, affordable housing and workforce housing. Okay, so what do we do about it? Um, we have to do a work within our, our zoning ordinance. And I, and I don't know if uh, a lot of uh, you all ever seen our zoning ordinance book, but I just brought it. It's right here. This is our Bible. You know, Joel, and uh, you know, he, he knows it by heart. Uh, and this is what we go for. And, and, and a lot of times I feel that, I, you know, I think the last time it was updated was 2016, but you know, that could be just some minor changes. But a lot of times is now we need to come to, the, uh, to a position where we need to look at how we're, and where you can build and what you can build. Now, first thing I want to talk about is um, sacred property or some property or a vista in, uh, in Lanesville that uh, we all want to protect. Well, that we did that at the, on, the, on the back shore with uh, uh, the overlay, uh, so nobody can build on that. And, uh, and I'm proud that I had proposed that and the city council finally and the planning board went, went, uh, went ahead with it. But these are the kind of things that you can do, is that you can do an overlay district if there's something you need to do, if you know, something you need to protect. And uh, this is ground, our, our, our grassroots. You have to come to <coughs> us and say to us, you know, Joe and the, the special councils, we want to protect this. We don't want anybody building on it. And, and see if we can find a way to make that happen. Now, how do we, how do we change some of the zoning? Zoning is very difficult. And uh, I just, uh, uh, for a definition of zoning, and just let me read it to you real quickly. Zoning is a restriction on the way land within the jurisdiction can be used to community planning and development. Zoning laws help local government agencies preserve property values and ensure communities are functional and safe. So that's, that's what the definition is. But I feel that we're, we're, we're come to the, to the point where we need to look at the definitions that our Bible, this is what was legally binding for us, uh, tells us. And now uh, we do a lot of special permits. And uh, there's five criteria that we go through that, uh, that probably, you know, I suggest that they need to be much more defined. Social, economic, community needs. Uh, traffic flow, that's obvious. Adequate mm -hmm. utilities, that's obvious. One that's, a, a, one that's problematic is neighborhood character and social structure. That needs to be defined. Because I interpret it one way, you interpret it another way. And, it's, and, and especially if it's a house next door to you, that's going to be, you know, tear, torn down. And, I think you have, a, you have a bigger concern. Qualities of the natural environment and potential impact to the neighborhood. These, these are things I think that maybe it's, it's that we've come to a point of time that we need to address. And one of the things that uh, I think that we, we trip over all the time is uh, views. And, you know, we look and we talk to the attorney and our, 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 our city attorney, and, uh, and he tells us that views, unless it's, you're sitting on the ocean, you don't own it. So we need to define that. And it is, you know, view obstruction. And, uh, and I think <coughs> moving forward, I think it has to come for you all. Come to us and move forward on it. You have a special project and whatever. And I can tell you that I'll be proactive and I'll work very hard to, hear, to, you know, to make what you think is good for your community and, uh, and make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Joseph? Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Joe Orlando, Jr., and I'm running for re-election to City Council at Large as well. I appreciate you all coming out on this rainy night tonight. And, uh, you know, I think the questions as posed are probably the most important topic that we're going to be facing as a council moving forward in the next uh, cycle, in the next two years. And in order to understand the problem fully, you always have to look at the history of the problem. We have a long, sad history, whether intentional or otherwise, of making bad zoning decisions that would preclude us from able to being able to build a diversity of housing. Did you know that in down, the downtown district, where multifamily properties are plentiful, more so than any other part of the city, you can't build a multifamily by right, which means you have to go to the ZBA and you have to ask for permission. That's just one example of a whole long history of adopting a zoning ordinance that was not really prescribed for a diversity of housing. So 
in order to understand how to solve the problem, you have to understand where we came from. And that's not just the downtown district. There's problems in Ward 5, Ward 4, Ward 1. There's problems in every district about how we build this. In Ward 5, there's a sewer line that can't take more than a couple of family home tied into it. That's not, that's not there, and it's not uh, designed for multifamily housing, which is where we see most affordable housing units. So the, uh, Councilor Lundberg pointed to the affordable, I'm sorry, for the housing production plan, which talks about the need for over 600 different types of units, a diversity of units, from market rate to affordable and everything in between. What we have to do is we have to find ways to make this more attractive place to build those. And I'm, I'm also, uh, I have to disagree with Councilor Shalino on one thing, and that is it doesn't have to come from you. You elect us to do this job. It's our job to look at the history. It's our job to look at the studies, and it's our job to put that into action. I'm very proud that I've already done this. I've been on the council for less than two years, and I've already tried at least to solve part of this problem. And, you know, I did so by filing a council order to seek to make units that are otherwise needed some permitting relief or zoning relief, getting that zoning relief and permitting relief, as long as they check all the boxes, the safety, the building specs, and all the like, will make that road easier for the applicant so long as they make that an affordable housing unit. That is just one way we can solve this problem, and there's a myriad of others. The biggest need right now is affordable units. Affordable units were at 7.5 roughly percent out of the 10 percent that's required by the state. Again, having to understand the full problem, you have to look at, well, what are these units being uh, marketed for? Well, an affordable unit, according to the standards of 80 percent AMI, as they would call it, those units are going for 1,500 for two bedrooms, 1,300 for, I'm sorry, 1,500 for three bedrooms, 1,300 for two bedrooms, and 1,100 for one bedrooms. Did you know that at the top of the harbor, at the heights, that's what those units are all going for? Those are market rate units in affordable rates. But because they're not deeded that way, it appears that we have an affordable housing shortage when we might actually not have one. So we have to start by looking at the units that actually are within the affordable rates and seeing if we can redefine these. Then we have to go to orders like the one I filed that over seven months or whatever it was, worked through the planning board, some amendments made. Other <coughs> councils up here made some good, uh, had some good ideas on amendments to that. Ultimately, the council together passed an order that will, I think, positively affect our affordable housing stock in the next three years. And there's other ideas as well. I'm very proud to be working with Councillor Val Gilman on a tiny house initiative that she filed. She filed a council order, and it really, me it really melded well with my idea of seeking a veterans affordable housing project in town. We had a great meeting with the mayor and the mayor's staff where we talked about how this can get done. We talked about a five point plan that they have in place, which includes tax title takings of properties the city owns. Where can we put these units? It includes rezoning, such as the ones I was talking about earlier, like the downtown district, building multifamily by right. These are just some ideas that are already in action and they're in action because of counselors who didn't need to wait. They just acted. I'm very proud to say that I'm a person who's a solution-based leader. I try to be. And that's what I'll continue to do for two years on the city council if you allow me to. But I also want you to pay attention to when someone says we're going to do something, look at their record. Have they done it before? Have they taken those studies that we've had for all these years, since 2000, since 2006, 2008, <coughs> 2010, and actually taken them and filed council orders, thank you, sir, and, and tried to make some positive changes? For me, I can say yes, I have. And I'll do it again. Councilor Gilman and I are still working on something all together. And whether I'm reelected or not, I'm going to continue to try to help along with that project because I think it's worthy. The three groups, I think, very briefly, that are the most important to touch here are the seniors who we want to keep here, the veterans who we want to give, when they come back from war or come back from overseas, a place to be a trampoline, a springboard where they can get themselves on their feet and their families. And the third is millennials who graduate college or, or grad school with a ton of student loans and an entry-level job. Thank you. So for those reasons, um, I think affordable housing is a thing we can solve, and we can solve it together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jamie. Good evening. My name's Jamie O'Hara. I'm one of your counselors at large. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I was a, as a citizen, I fought to open up your Bayview Fire Station 10 years ago, at a time when we had limited emergency services. Um, I took a stand along with a couple of your uh, residents, Russell Hobbs and Greg Smith. We fought to get the stations open and we were success successful because I think that should be the highest priority of this city is protecting our 
our uh, citizens, taxpayers. Regarding the affordable housing and our housing stock, we have a, a double-edged sword. We all know that Gloucester has been discovered. We see it every summer in the number of people that come to our city. We're grateful that they come to our city, visit our beaches, but that has driven up the cost of real estate in Gloucester. Um, we talk about the tiny homes, uh, which are, as Joe is a member of the Millennial, um, they live for a small. They don't want the, the, uh, the excessive mortgage payments. They live for today versus tomorrow, so it's small. We have lot sizes that don't accommodate a small home, 1,000 to 1,300 square foot home. So we have to look at the zoning regulations. Uh, the problem is we don't have much open space. Obviously, as has been mentioned tonight, it's teardowns. Now, someone's buying a home, obviously, we've talked about the prices of real estate today, rather high. So they're tearing down an existing home that they've paid a fair sum of money, go in and get a mortgage. They can't build a 1,300-square-foot home and have a bank justify that mortgage. So it's really looking at rezoning to accommodate that. We have the seniors today. I've been knocking on hundreds of doors, talking to seniors, and they're struggling. Obviously, they don't have the opportunity at going and getting a second job or getting one job. They're living on their, their retirement, Social Security. They don't have a way of increasing that, and they're just trying to survive. They stay home nervous. How are they going to pay that excessive water and sewer bill that we have in the city? I can't tell you. That is one of the most horrible questions that I'm hearing knocking on doors. Family of five, $500 a quarter water and sewer bill. Obviously, the taxes are secondary, but we need to adjust. We need to work harder as a city to be more economical to provide to our citizens a more economical to our seniors, to virtually everybody. The affordable housing, obviously, we, we talk about artists, workers. We need to bring jobs into our city. Only 90, only 10 percent of our tax base are commercial or industrial. We need to bring jobs into the city, good jobs. I can honestly say, and I'll say it publicly, I've said it on every doorstep, we don't need any more retail space in the city. We have empty spaces at Gloucester Crossing, Main Street, Eastern Ave. It's all over the place. We need real manufacturing jobs that bring a good income. No job is a bad job. I want to qualify that. But we need real jobs that make real money for our citizens of Gloucester. Obviously, you go down to the Rotary <coughs> from 6 o'clock till 9 o'clock, and you see traffic. Where's the majority of that traffic going? It's heading south. They're going to try to find income that they can sustain life here in Gloucester. So the, the, the housing, we, as, as a council, we can control minimal. We can't control what the houses are going for. Zoning, we don't have open spaces that we can. Other cities and towns, Nantucket's looking at, at tiny homes. Other <coughs> communities that have larger, larger land, we can they can cut up and look at 1,000, 1,300 square foot homes. But again, it comes down to dollars and cents. So we, we need, I believe we really need to look at the cost of us doing biz, business as a city of Gloucester, taking care of our people who are here, creating jobs that will address our housing with time. Obviously, the, the fuller school, I'm a proponent of keeping the developer at providing that affordable housing that is mandated by, by our ordinance. Because again, we need those. We need those units for the people of our city. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> My name is Melissa Cox. Unfortunately, I've got a bit of a cold, so let me know if you can't hear me and I will try to speak up, but I am really happy I can just talk tonight. Um, as far as my personal perspective on housing trends, um, from the time that I moved here um, to the time that I have now bought and sold or 
bought two houses, sold one. Um, <clears throat> I've seen the increase in property values skyrocket. The, the cost of the houses are, are much larger than um, what they were when I bought my first house. And I see a lot of friends and family and neighbors um, complaining about the ability to even find a rental unit for their family. And it's hard. Um, and, you know, even retail artist space, uh, stuff like that, it, it's really hard to come by in the city. That's something that's affordable. Um, how do I propose we handle this? Um, I think the first thing is, you know, the housing production plan, that came about um, and we found out we got looped in with Boston. Their um, income ratio, housing ratio, were lumped into that. One of the first things that I would want to do is try to figure out how we can remove ourselves from that because that's a big problem. People that are coming in and looking at uh, buying houses or even developing housing, they're looking at that model to figure out what they can charge for rent. And we don't make what Boston makes. So it's extremely hard for us to be looped in with Boston regarding rental rates when we don't make that money. And we're never going to make that money. If I wanted to drive into Boston, I could probably make $30,000 more than I'm making now. And I just recently went through a job transition, so I do know that that is a fact. But I want to live and work close to home. So that's a choice that I made. Um, the, the second thing that I'd like to look at is we have a lot of underutilized land that the city owns, whether they took it through foreclosure or, you know, tax title, unpaid um, real estate, or even um, just land that through time no one knew who owned it, so we've acquired it. Um, a lot of that is forested land. Um, there's a huge track behind my house, um, and I live on Warner Street downtown, but between Fuller and uh, Portugie Hill, there's a large area of land that is forested. Um, it could be a good property for um, affordable housing. It, it could be developed. I mean, there's lots of stuff like that that we're not really looking into. And this is one thing that I was hoping that Councilor Lundberg would take credit for, but I will give him credit for it because I want him to, is that as the P&D Committee, the Planning and Development Committee, we asked um, two years ago for a list of the underutilized land in the city, stuff that we owned, stuff that we could do with, and we still don't have that. Um, this is the proactive nature of the city council members that you have now. And we really need to um, look at what we have in stock and what we have, what we can do with that stock. And I think that's one of our, our biggest oversights as a city that we're not looking at. Um, as far as my experience with affordable housing, um, you know, I've tried to work with Harbor Light Community Partners in Action. Um, there's one other group that I'm not remembering their name um, right now, but specifically the Cameron's Project. Um, that was a 40B. Uh, there was very little that we as city councilors could do about the project because it was, you know, they could do whatever they wanted to do with the project. But working with the developers, we managed to have three extremely productive public meetings to draw input into what the building should look like, the, you know, the housing, what it should be one minute, or, sorry, <laughs> one unit, um, one unit, two unit, you know, those kind of things. And, and learning about those units and, and affordable housing and the requirements and the restrictions, I mean, it's really overwhelming. So you can only have one child in a two bedroom or, you know, they have to be opposite sex and it's just, it's really overwhelming. But I've been working with Andrew DeFrenza with Harbor Light Partners and learning so much from him <clears throat> regarding what we're, what we're able to do and contacting them as well when we do have opening bids to try to get them to come and, and do more stuff here in Gloucester. To date, they have not done any projects yet, and I would love for them to be here. Thank you very much.
The last candidate. Uh, as Jamie said, Gloucester has been discovered. People have been coming here to spend summers and vacations for years and Excuse years. Excuse me, could you introduce yourself? So, I'm sorry? Could you introduce yourself first? Uh, don't you please? know me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm Bob Weinart, and I, I was a city clerk for 17 years, and I did a lot of uh, vote, voting in this, this building, and I always felt that uh, Lanesville people uh, seem to be born as voters because of, of all the wards, you, you have the highest amount of voters. And the wards are split up by population, and they have to be within 5% of each other every time you redistrict. But that doesn't mean there's going to be the same amount of voters. So you guys, especially 4-2, biggest voter block of any, and I'm, I think that's, we should thank you for that, I'm proud of that. Anyway, uh, people have been coming here for years, and uh, now they're starting to move in here. And the, the old model of the old uh, multiple family houses with uh, three floors and and three families, and maybe you keep take care of your grandparents, which that sounds good to me, but uh, uh, those, are, those are slowly going, and we're getting to be, the condo is the king, and I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. And uh, when, I, when I worked in Boston, I used to take the train, and I used to really grouch about how long it took to get to Boston, but now I th I, I'm thankful for that, because if we had a train that could get here in 30 minutes, We'd be a yuppie city here, and they'd be moving in in, in hordes, and, and uh, they, they don't necessarily want to keep our heritages and the, uh, the historical buildings and things that we want to keep. Uh, the, Ward 4 has always had uh, large, large lots, and everybody liked it that way. And as long as you don't sell them, then, then it's fine. You can have the kind of uh, community that we've always had here. Um, so I think... If you know why, how you want your community to look, then you can look at zoning and see what do we have to do to keep that. Because that's the only way to do it is to have the zoning uh, be proactive in your zoning and, and uh, have the house lots the size you want and uh, put things where you want to put them. Uh, you don't want a gas station next door to your house. Uh, so, you, so you have to do that and you have to do the zoning. I think uh, I'm going to mention the full school, even though that's not up. I voted against selling it. I think it's a mistake. Uh, I think we're going to need a couple of new schools, and where are they going to go? And I'm told that we've got, we own plenty of land, but it's going to cost money. We paid $4 million for that over 40 years ago for that school, and we just sold it for $4 million. Now, I, at 40, I took that. 40 years ago, I could have bought a Cadillac brand new for $7,000. Can't do that now. I don't know if anything that stayed the same over all that time. So I think we gave that property away and that we're gonna need it. And so one of the things we talked about, affordable housing, we're at 7%. If we get a 10%, uh, then, then 40B can't come in anymore. They can't steamroll over our, our, our uh, uh, boards and commissions. They only, they only have to, they, they, 40B only has to go to the uh, Board of Appeals and no one else, nowhere else. And if they get turned down by them, usually they win in, in the state. So. I want to hold the, I, now that we sold the property, uh, I want to hold the people, their feet to the fire. <laughs> and, and never mind trying to buy your way out of it. You knew what you were getting into, and you knew you promised us so much affordable housing, I'd like to see that, that sticks, they stick to that. Because we still don't have assisted living uh, that we're supposed to have in Gloucester Crossing. And I, that, I had my eyes on that later on. Anyway, so uh, you've got a wonderful community here, a lot of heritage a lot of history, history, and you want to preserve it. So I think we can do that together. And, uh, and the zoning ordinance is, is a, a, a movie, not a snapshot. So we can change it. And that's what we need to do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for your. <laughs> Thank you all for your very thoughtful comments. We're now going to move into the um, time for you all to participate and a couple of ground rules we'd like you to um, agree to. One is to focus your comments on housing, which is the focus for this evening. Secondly, that you not pose a question to a particular candidate because we don't have the time for them to individually respond. They'll be collectively responding to the group's comments in their three-minute wrap-up. Uh, we ask that you don't have side conversations with your neighbors because 
these folks have to listen to everyone's comments and we want you to listen to each other's comments so please no whispering between each other it's very hard to hear um, we ask that you give your name and where you live not your address but your neighborhood and that you'll have two to three minutes uh, and Damien will time you and give you the same wave at 30 seconds are up and when your time is done. Obviously, if you only take two minutes and are more concise, we'll have more opportunity for people to share. So I'll just kind of start in the front and move, move our way backwards. So they need, we need, you'll pass that to them? Okay, great. Yes, sir. I don't need that. Yes, sir. It's not for the room, it's for the camera. Thank okay. you. I'm Thank you. Duncan Nelson, and I'm going to put my Bardic Bays on. And I want to say something here at the beginning from all of us to all of you. When we're hearing from Bob and Melissa and Jamie, we know there'll be no cockamamie talk. And as for Joseph and Joe, again we'll be sure the to and fro will be while spirited, fair, and just. And as for Paul and Jen, we can trust. They're a perfect fit within this large-hearted group of candidates who have chartered their courses to shore up Gloucester's success. So to them all, we say, God bless, and prepare ourselves for voting knowing whoever we choose, they'll be going all out to make this fishing city past masters of the nitty-gritty, as well as of the big picture. So we're tickled to pick from such a rich mixture. So we thank you all. Thank you. What a great way to start. Right there. You won the debate. Hi, Patty Page. I'm from um, Ward 41 off of Wheeler Street. I'm told it's Lower Wheeler's Point. Um, my question would concern the coast and the FEMA flood zones. How you would attempt to address building or non building in these coastal zones. Um, FEMA flood is an issue now, and I did. I uh, hear that part of the special permitting was safe environment. Every piece of property on the water isn't deemed safe anymore. That's why FEMA's requesting these 9 foot and 14 foot pilings and heights. We have 10 condos going in currently on the Great Marsh. That, that, that's really important. Um, it, it, it's detrimental to the environment by nature. It, also, undeveloped serves as a protection for housing behind it. That's all lost once it's developed. So I'd like to find out, however these get answered, what your thoughts are about coastal development. <coughs> Thank you. I think the woman behind you this way. Oh, I Did thought you, you were all asking our questions first. No, can, can, I, can I just say, I'm sorry. Yeah. What we were hoping is that this is really more of a forum, as Judith said, a conversation. And I think we were asking your personal experiences, your stories, your perspectives, your ideas. And if you have a question for them, that's fine, too. But we're trying to learn, all of us together, collectively, what is happening here. And we're very interested in whatever you have to say about what your own personal experience is and your thoughts about all of that, rather than just questions for them. They, they'll respond at the end. My name is Lenore, is this on? My name is Lenore Bolero and I live in Lanesville, right down the street, um, 1022 Washington near Plum Cove Beach. And um, I have actually two concerns as a homeowner. One is that um, <coughs> um, I'm, I'm struck by the, un I'm, I'm really a proponent of um, tiny houses, small houses, so I'm excited that you're investigating that, Val. Um, one of the interesting things, I think, in Lanesville is that there are, this has to do with the zoning ordinances, there are a lot of homes that have outbuildings, different kinds of outbuildings that 
it used to be used as seasonal rentals or for other purposes. And at one point, I approached one of my neighbors <coughs> and said, I want to buy that little building in the, you know, that's in your, on your property. And he said, we can't do that we, it, because of the zoning laws. If you want to change the zoning laws, then you know, if, you, if you can get the zoning laws to be changed, then a lot of these outbuildings could be transformed into small houses. And they're big, big, huge yards, and there's not a lot of kids around anymore. And it seems to be an un, uninvestigated, un, unexplored um, possibility in, uh, in Lanesville, where you could bring in um, people who could afford to either rent or live, buy these homes, re, you know, refurbish them, bring them back to livable space and you know bring some um, you know vitality um, while still preserving the you know the nature of the community so I think I don't know what the zoning laws are that um, prohibit that but it seems to be a very rich area for exploration um, and the second thing is when I lived in the greater Boston area before I moved up here um, I, I lived in a community where if you, li if you were an owner-occupied home, you got, a ta you got a property tax break. And um, if you just, and, you know, and, and when I moved to Gloucester, I expected that, you know, that same benefit because there are neighbors, more and more neighbors around me who are building, knocking down buildings, building really huge homes, and, they, um, and they're not there. They're there for like a week or two out of the year. They don't... They don't shovel their sidewalks. They don't plow their sidewalks. They're not very, they're not very <coughs> pleasant to their neighbors who um, have to, you know, who do live there 12 months of the year, walk to the, walk down the sidewalks. So I'm wondering, you know, why that's never been since Gloucester is a coastal community, and there are a lot of people who do live here, not, uh, they're not, you know, owner occupied all the time. Why we don't have that, um, that same benefit as homeowners who are owner-occupied. It seems like something that would give a break to the homeowners while still placing more of a, um, you know, an, okay, I'm done. <laughs> Hello, my name is Len Gyllenhaal. I live in the Long Beach side, uh, Gloucester side of Long Beach. Uh, my first question, um, Bob talked about um, the Fuller School. Um, 200 units, that adds 20 more units to our inventory that aren't counted, and that for a million and a half dollars, that's a ridiculous amount. Um, and I'm wondering if city council can look to increase the amount of money that builders have to pay to avoid uh, affordable housing. Um, under 40B, um, as has been said, you have to have 10% of your stock affordable. If Gloucester continues to build and grow, it becomes mathematically impossible for us to ever get to 10%. So I think we ought to put less emphasis on 40B and more um, emphasis on apartments that are market rate that, that can be built and rented out below what's getting to be a pretty high price for affordable. That's a, a part of the housing stock that I think we have to look at. The other problem with 40Bs is in the event that they're not rented, uh, the owner is, is um, let me start at the beginning, all 40B projects are voucher based. And what that means is if they cannot find people at the rate uh, that the formula gives, they can then have people that have uh, vouchers move into the apartments. Um, I think that's a big threat to Gloucester. I think that would bring in people that don't live in Gloucester into Gloucester, and I think that's something that should be considered. As you can <coughs> guess, I'm not a fan of 40B. And, and the last thing that I would uh, ask the council to consider is for people that have a certain amount of years living in Gloucester and reach a certain age, to freeze their property taxes. Thank you. I'm Next getting person. older, I might qualify. <laughs> <laughs> Over here. My name is 
I'm Elizabeth Enfield. I've been living here, although I came for one year. I've been now 35 years. And when I first came, I came down to continue research on a diary of a woman who was from Anasquam and lived to be 92 years old, from 1833 to 1925. I still continue working on it. I've done a lot of lectures and are hoping to do a book. The first thing I did was to rent a place for me and my son. And I was renting, and then I saw an ad for a garage in Rockport. I bought that. I was able to turn it into a two-bedroom cottage, just the size it was, go up one story, and then it remained like that for the rest of that time. As I was an antique dealer, I needed more space, and I found the old saloon that's on Washington Street at 1095 Washington Street. And after about nine years of living in Rockport, I bought that one, did the same thing, went for a variance, and very modestly, fixed it up. It's only 18 feet wide, 33 feet long. It was two stories. I added one story only by using the attic that was already there. I've kept really much concern about people, you know, looking at my building, my porch to the side of the kitchen, which is also the exterior to get down and an exit, is only three feet wide. So I've done that. What really disturbs me, and I've been to art school, and my father's an architectural designer, and I've, you know, studied architecture myself is to see these big, huge mansions. I went to visit a friend the other day in Wheeler's Point and saw this humongous mansion. It looks like it's five feet from each house on either side. And I stopped to talk to some of the people there to see what was happening. And I don't know if they opposed it. I don't know if they went to meetings. But this man built this most gargantuan thing. And then I spoke to somebody local, and I said, did you ever drive around Wheeler's Point? And he says, well, I go by that place you're talking about in my boat. He said, you should see the other side of it from the ocean. <laughs> it's really terrible. I mean, these are people blocking views, building houses for maybe two people and a couple of kids with mammoth-sized rooms and everything. And it's killing the views that people have there. And it's gone on all over the place. I think there was a 175 window place that was opposed here that got through. We really have to have people who are going to help manage and listen. I went the other day because a man bought two houses across the street from me, uh, right next to the liquor store, and he wanted to put up some dormer. So the person next door was losing sight of the ocean. I lost 90% of the view I had from my little tiny porch where I have a little table, and in the summers I have lunch or breakfast there. And I could see between the liquor store and this private house with this dormer. They approved it even though there is a loss of view. And I'm hoping to work things out with a man who's the builder, because he can go up and not extend it the three feet that he got uh, <coughs> and use the conforming part of it. But I really would like to see these people go to some of these meetings. I did go to that vari the variance that was asked for that, which is across the street from me a few you know, weeks ago. And I never heard of the one on Wheeler's Point. I never heard until later, and it was too late for the 175 windows. It is important for housing. I mean, I live very modestly. I'm trying to stop. <laughs> going up. But I'm into it for everyone to have a nice view, et cetera, et cetera, and to have what they say they're going to do. And I'm really on your side about that. Thank you. Keeping them committed to the Thank you. What's next? Uh, my name is Alexander Sands. I live in Anasquam. Uh, just a couple of things about 40B. First of all, I think everybody realizes 40B has a mandate for 10% affordable housing. That is a minimum. It, and it, it says it right in the statute. It's minimum. If you're above the 10%, 40B is still applicable. There, there's a lot of case law on that. So a community, it's not the same requirement once you're over the 10 percent, but uh, a community can still do 40B housing under the statute. The statute was enacted in 1969, 48 years ago, and as of today, roughly one-third of the communities in the state have hit that 10 percent, 48 years later. So just a, a quick comment. Uh, several of you commented on the Fuller School project, which is a, a rather major project, 200 units, and I've been concerned what I've been reading in the paper that the, uh, how the affordable housing is going to fit into there. Uh, it, it wasn't brought as a 40B project. They're talking about putting the 40B housing downtown at the old Y. But there doesn't seem to be a requirement that that be a part of the project. And the intent of the 40B statute was to get affordable housing in here. So I'm just hoping that 
uh, all of you who are on the city council will address the, the issue when you're voting on the Fuller School Project. And remember that the whole purpose for that statute 48 years ago was to get affordable housing in and don't lose track of, uh, of that fact when you vote. Thank you. Anyone else? Ken Hecht, can you hear that? Yeah. Ken Hecht, uh, member of the planning board, uh, Ward 2 City Council uh, candidate. Uh, I live on Main Street in the old bank building where Blue River, River Diamonds is. I'm a huge advocate for affordable housing. I'm on the planning board we've, we've struggled with. We've learned about affordable housing with respect to the Fuller School. And finally, I think I have something in my head that is how we should approach it. If the units are built at the Fuller School, these are going to be at 80 percent income requirement of, as Melissa said, a regional income. That means that if you make around between 85 and 90 thousand dollars, you'll qualify for that. That would be the qualification for that housing. Okay, so that's at 80 percent of area median income. So I don't think that's hitting our nail on the head. I think we've got problems with people that make a far less money than that, and that's really where we have to put our focus. So we asked the Y, who is a you know they own 300 affordable units today. And they're doing a joint venture with um, Harbor Light. So they're going to have a total of 700 units among them. These are both mission-driven organizations. We asked them, work with us, get creative. How do we improve this? If, you don't want, if your partner, the apartment developer, doesn't want the units on site, what are we going to do? And so they came up, to their credit, with a plan. And preliminarily, they think they can fit 53 affordable units on the current Y site. But these units are going to be 30 to 60 percent of AMI which means someone's going to qualify, can make $30,000 to, to $58,000. This is where we need to be. This is our firefighters. This is our veterans. This is our teachers. This is our dishwashers. These are the people who live and work here. This is the kind of housing that they need. So, and I know that they're not going to be able to tie the project directly to the permits for the Fuller site. However, I look at some of the people on the board of directors and who are in charge, the people at the Y. I think they're very mission driven. One of the guys who's with, you know, Harbor Light is uh, Bob Gillis. And when Bob Gillis says something, I believe him. So I really feel that I would rather have 53 units at 30 to 60 percent, which means 30,000 to say low, high 50, uh, low 50s, around 50,000 to 60,000 of income, than I would 30 units at $85,000 to qualify. So I think we need to keep our eye on the prize. We need to keep our eye on the prize, and we need to get more affordable units in here for the 30 to 60 percent AMI. Those are the people we need to work with. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else right here. Uh, hi, Joel Favaza. I'm a local real estate attorney. So um, one thing we've heard a lot of tonight, we've heard concerns about um, building too close to the water for environmental reasons, the FEMA flood maps causing buildings by the water to inherently go up in height. We've heard about people worried about buildings out of character, coming into a neighborhood and changing the character of a neighborhood. We've heard about expensive buildings being <coughs> built and pricing people out of their ability to purchase homes or even maintain their own homes as their property value goes up uh, by proxy. And so um, those are all you know, valid concerns that I hear a lot as a real estate attorney. I also hear on the other side um, that, you know, it's, it's funny, different perspectives, right? So developers that I work with are always appalled at how difficult they feel it is to get anything done in Gloucester. And so while you have neighbors who feel trampled, like developers can come in and do whatever they want, you have these developers feeling like they are hamstrung. You know, they say, Joel, I, I've been doing projects all over the state, all over the country. I've never seen a more obstructive planning board, city council, city staff. They're, you know, I get this all week, all month, all year from developers coming in to do residential projects, commercial projects. Um, and so you have this huge spectrum here where you have one, you know, side of the equation who already feel there's not enough protection in the ordinance. And you have another side of the equation feeling like the ordinance is so protectionist. I'm curious to hear how any of you might, you know, find a common ground whereby both sides of that um, divide could be equally served. 
over here. Um, and I, I, while we're passing the mic, I just want to remind the candidates that obviously you can't speak to everyone's concerns in three minutes. So please feel uh, it's important to speak to the things that you identify as priorities. Um, I'm Frank Garrison. I live across the street, and I've been here since uh, 1975. And at that point, I was uh, sort of a, a newbie around town, and I'm a, car a carpenter. I'm not making a lot of money. I never had to make a lot of money, but I'm blessed by the fact that I bought a piece of property then. And I think it also uh, uh, is the same for those people who grew up here. Uh, because possibly they inherited their family property. But to, for me to buy my house now, which is somewhat around six hundred to $700,000, and I bought it at $33,000, you see, um, there is a significant uh, difference there. And so I see in my experience of living in this lovely village is that there are a lot of people like me who are hardworking people, and they don't make a lot of money. And they still want to live here because it's the place they either grew up or their, you know, their parents are still here or whatever. It's a gorgeous community. I love this place. So that's the problem is that if I go out on the street and I tell people how wonderful it is, they're going to say, gee, this place is really valuable. I think I'm going to buy into this community. So I'm sort of going to keep my, my mouth shut because I don't really <laughs> want all that pressure on us. I mean, it's a joke. But basically, that's the point is that we evaluate it by loving it. And uh, other people catch on and they find a little cottage over there in the water and they tear it down and they put up this m monster place. And as they say, they only stay there for two weeks out of the year and they think they're, they're Lane's villains. Well, I don't think so. Um, so anyway, so that's the, that's the overlay is that yes, we have to worry about the general city, but I think we also have to worry about our village. And um, a lot of us here are from, the, are from Lanesville. And I think that's what we also for Ward 2 should concentrate on is we don't necessarily want to move out hardworking people like me because it makes it much more hard and much more difficult for you to find people like me because I'm one of the people who fixes out your door when it falls off <laughs> and I don't you don't have to go to Lawrence to find it to find a guy to you know fix your door you see so I think that we're we should integrate various levels of people and income levels in our community. It makes a healthy community. You know, we're, we're not all from Scarsdale, you know. So um, that's what I think is important when we think about is how we are going to keep our village uh, uh, with a wide range of experiences here. And, and so that's, that's what I really think that we should look at. Yes, we should try to codify it in the Bible that Joe is uh, looking at over there. And I think that somehow we have to, like, make it a little softer, a little bit, a little bit, um, you know, schmoozy, so we can, we can figure out how we can do it, rather than to just do it by money. You see, that's the that's the baseline. Is I buy your house, tear it down, and I'm going to put up a 500 to a thousand to a million dollar property. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Linda McCarris, and I live on Quarry Street. <clears throat> And I've only been there since uh, 2010, and I've been on Cape Ann since uh, 2009. I grew up in Lynn uh, and left Lynn at about 30, and for about 40 years was away. Um, my life took me away. <clears throat> and the last 20 or so I spent uh, teaching um, in Alaska, uh, which I really didn't want to do. I was not one of these people who couldn't wait to go to Alaska and have the adventure and find my identity and do all of the things that people go to Alaska to do. <clears throat> I went to Alaska because at the time I went, at the age of 50, I had no retirement and I had no health insurance. And I was the only stupid person who was originally from Massachusetts who didn't know enough to just go home and say, I don't have any retirement, I don't have any health insurance, and I don't have a place to live. So take care of me. So when we talk about affordable housing, for instance, we talk about those numbers. When I got, when I got my retirement, all I wanted to do was come back home. And come back home was for me to go back to Lynn. And Lynn never was exactly Gloucester, and it's gotten much worse as a city that is 
host really now to, I don't know how else to say it, but I mean, it's all Section 8 or whatever it is. When I grew up there, it was a working class city, and now it's a non-working city. It's a very different place. I loved Gloucester because Gloucester seemed to me to be like the land I grew up in, in a lot of ways. It was working, working people in working neighborhoods. And um, the real reason I'm here is because I had a horse for 30 years. And uh, when I came back from Alaska, I needed a place to live with her. And I found Charlie Lane's place in Rockport. And so I came to Cape Ann. There was no place close to Lynn where I could keep her. So here I, so, and besides, I love Gloucester. What I'm trying to say is this. I am an instance of affordable housing. I live in a 960 square foot, one floor uh, stucco bungalow set down below the road with no cellar and no attic. You can't stand up on either, either end. I contribute to this economy the money I spent 20 years in the gulag <laughs> earning. <laughs> All right, I earned it. I didn't want to be there. I didn't go there with some hairy chested man. I went there by myself. I drove there by myself from the East Coast. It took me 12 days. It was 4,788 miles. I was 50 years old. And I slept in the back of my pickup because there aren't places to stay along the Alaska-Canada Highway. So all I'm saying is, when we talk about categories of people, uh, in addition to two, three, four generation Lanesvillians or Gloucesterites, there are people like me that I've met around here who are New Englanders, North Shore people, who uh, are here for a host of odd reasons. Many of them retired like me, and they retired with a little bag of money that they actually collected themselves by working their butts off one way or another for many, many years. We're not taking anything. We're contributing to. And we need to be put into this mix of needs. You know, when I find out that my road, which is a very heavily traveled road, is a road I'm going to have to pay to have fixed, I couldn't believe that on top of having the taxes come in uh, in the water bill. I couldn't believe that. I paid $208,000 for my house in, in 2010, and I was lucky to get it. And it's a rinky-dink little house, and I know that most of the people who have Section 8 vouchers wouldn't look twice at it. And this town is full of people like me, some younger, many my age. I'm going to be 75 my next birthday. And we make do with our crummy old electric stoves and our crummy old dishwasher and whatever else we have, um, figure us in to this. We're contributors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, in the back, if you could pass to Steve back there. And while we're passing the mic, I just want to recognize um, our city councilor, Val Gilman. His name has come up many times, and to make sure you all know her and know that she's been very active. Is, is always here for all the events we have here, so thank you, Val, for you. being here. Steve. Yeah, I, I didn't think I was going to say anything, so I was writing notes on my hand, and now I can't, I can't, can't see my hand anymore. Uh, I think the key, we sorry, need Sorry, can you say name and yeah, I'm sorry. where you live? Yeah, my name is Stephen Voltz, and I live um, on Calder Street, over uh, on Wheeler's Point, not at Wheeler's Point, on, uh, in East Gloucester. We looked at a house on Wheeler's Point, I almost got there. And I lived, before that, I lived near the high school. Um, the, the issue for to getting more units is density, and I, I wanna, I'd love to hear from you guys on how we're going to find that density. I, I thought some really good thoughts here about taking the, the auxiliary buildings and being able to, to subdivide those and make those units. And that gives us another unit on every, every lot we can subdivide and put another unit on, especially if we can do it in a, in a garage or a barn or something that keeps the character of the neighborhood. That's another unit without making another, without opening up new space, without cutting down more trees or whatever else. The other place to go when there's no land is up. Now, no one wants skyscrapers or apartment buildings here, but there are parts of town where we could have four, five, six, seven, eight-story apartment buildings. If that was something that had been done at Gold Golf the Crossing, people wouldn't be freaking out if there was a nice uh, five-story apartment building there. Um, so we need to think about where we're going to find those units. And the other, the other issue then is um, the, the people here were concerned about 
and I am too, about these ridiculous, gigantic, I, that house on Wheeler's Point, which is actually right near where we almost moved, that's this ridiculous, I can't, there's no word for it. One thing, monstrosity is a good one. One thing we could look at, I've never heard of this before. I've looked at a lot of zoning laws, but um, we have maximum height limits. We have maximum, uh, we have all kinds of limits in zoning, and we have minimum uh, square footage. I'd love to see a look at maximum square footage per unit. So if, you have a, if it's a one-unit house with one owner, one family, think about putting a cap on that, and that would help keep these monstrosities that we're seeing that are going all the way to the border that are only to house two people, four people. Um, I've never heard of that. It may not be okay under the zoning law. I don't know why it wouldn't be. Um, the other thing to think about is if we could somehow get 500, 600, 700, 800 units at, for people that make $50,000, $60,000 a year, all of Massachusetts is going to stream here, and those aren't going to go to the people here who need that housing. So I'd urge you guys to think about, as you're designing, you're making the plan, working regionally and talking to the neighboring towns and other people, other boards and communities nearby, because we need to work together. So if we suddenly solve the problem, that solves it for the people who we're trying to solve it for, and not for people who start to commute and come here and come here because we've got suddenly really good, cheap housing. And then the last thing, just to say for, for those of you who are worried about the houses next door down the street that suddenly get a, a variance or a special permit and can do things like block your view, which they've probably got a right to do unless they get a, unless it's, if they need zoning relief really for that, talk to a lawyer very quickly because you've got a very tight window to appeal those decisions. Often, if it's a variance, you've got a really good chance at getting the thing overturned, but you need to talk to somebody very fast. Though the 40A is designed to help developers and to keep people like us from making, doing the appeals. I, I, I used to, to represent developers in a prior life, and I know how that system works. It's made to work for people who know the system and not for ordinary people. So talk to somebody right away. If you, you may or may not have a chance, but you want to talk right away and find out. Good. Thank you. Other comments? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, my name is Paul Blanding, uh, 51 Forty Street. Uh, one thing I want to say first off is to Council why not and anybody else that voted against Fuller School, I think that was the biggest giveaway that we ever did. Uh, we should have never, got, never given that away. I don't care whether it's housing or not, it's a place that we should have kept or got a lot more money for. Anyways, aside from that, was the same thing, uh, people that want to build these big huge houses and they don't live here, and I don't know if it's legal or not, but I think if you did something like created like a surtax, if, you're not, if they're not going to live here, uh, they should pay, the, them or the developers should pay a certain percentage more. And if it's somebody that's going to live here and they've lived here for 10 years, then that surtax can go away and it could be deferred for 10 years. But people that are just going to build houses just because they can and then not live here, they should pay a lot more money. And that money could go into a fund maybe to help people that live here uh, afford to buy, buy houses here or something because it's <coughs> ridiculous. I, I plow snow. I see every year there's more and more big houses on these little tiny roads. They won't give up any of their roadway for the, for the snow plows or anything. They'll put walls up. They'll build big, huge houses where there was just a little tiny summer shack. And that's another thing. If they're going to build these houses on these little summer roads, they should also give up some of the road. Say, you know, you want to build a big, huge house? The road's only nine feet wide. Guess what? You've got to give up some of your roadway, you know? Cut back about three or four feet. Don't put a wall right on the edge of the road. And that's what they do. And then when, the, then when they get snow in there, if they happen, do happen to come there or see snow in their yard, then they call up and complain to the city and we have to go push the snow out of the road. It's ridiculous. I mean, half these roads, you can't plow them. And they're getting worse. Uh, people buy houses. They tear them down. Uh, uh, places where you used to be able to turn around, you can't turn around anymore uh, because people have put either big houses there or they've put putting greens there. Uh, I'm not going to mention who, but there's somebody here that put a putting green at the end of a road that I used to be able to turn around and open up the road, and now I can't. Now they've put pea stone down, and they've put, put rocks halfway across, going across the road to hold their pea stone on the hill. So now when I plow up the hill, I'm going to hit the stones there. It's like, do you want me to plow the road or not? Oh, that's right. You don't live there, so you really don't care, you know? Meanwhile, the people that do live on the road that actually work here can't get up and down the road because, of, because, because, because there's, there's no, you know, it's, it's a road that's not plowable to begin with. And it was summer houses, so, you know, give up a little bit of your, your stuff. Anyways, that's it. Oh, and one more thing. Please, do not give up the I-4-C2 parcel under any circumstances. I don't care what idiotic idea 
or what good idea somebody has. That should be something that this town needs. The town needs space downtown to keep it vital. Not, it doesn't need a shopping center like we sold it before and then had to buy it back for more money. Keep it. Uh, it's a good place for festivals, good place for parking, <laughs> underground parking garage maybe, and then more parking up top. Don't give it away. Please don't give it away. All right. Let's um, hear from other people who haven't spoken yet. One okay. back here. This gentleman and then the woman behind afterwards. Leaves, and I live at 1111 Washington Street. Um, this is a subject that's uh, close to my heart. I am a uh, planner for the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, as well as, as, well as a uh, former city planner for the city of Gloucester back in the 90s. Um, all of the issues that you've raised have been raised for many years. I want to reassure everyone that everyone on the North Shore, many towns, are facing the same issues. I'm currently working in Manchester and Middleton, helping them to redo their, their master plan. So all of the issues around affordable housing, uh, running into issues around open space, where you can build, how you can build, these are issues that the city has been uh, battling with for many, many years. Um, I want it, and we could talk about it all night, and we've spent many nights talking about it already. I want to briefly say I want to circle back around to the housing production plan that MAPC, the group that I work for, which is your regional planning agency and funded by your, your tax dollars, your assessment dollars, um, wrote the housing production plan for the city of Gloucester. Um, if the city wants to follow up the housing production plan, I know that we would be able to work and find money for the city to go and work with the planning department and look at the zoning book and find out where we can find more housing. The catch is people say they want housing, but do you really? Because there's a lot of constraints on building in Gloucester. It's a very tough place to build. People don't want, we, we've talked about more height downtown for years. We've talked about adding units to West Gloucester. No, can't do that, no sewer. You talk about adding units, that means more cars, that means more units, that more means more people. So um, there are towns that commit to this. Um, there are really good tools locally. There are tools to deal with mansionization, right? Uh, you can't control the interior size of a house, but you can definitely control how it sits on a lot. And that's new to Massachusetts law. So a lot of towns are catching up to this. Housing is big and this stuff runs in cycles. So. It can be done, and I would urge um, the folks who are, are running for council uh, and, and to keep their eye on the ball and direct sources back to RPA. Find the grant money, and we can at least do the studies, and that's when the real battle begins, because when we bring you back the solutions, you have to support them, to pass them, because we've talked about this many times before, and for those of you who've been involved with this, I see a lot of familiar faces over time, people who might be new to town. I grew up in Cape Ann. I've been here most of my life. I live in Lansville now. I grew up in Rockport. These are really tough issues, and it usually means more people in a smaller space because we're, you know, half half a Gloucester is protect open space. So we go from there. But I'd be happy to work with you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was. So I, I'd like to ask permission to just ask each counselor just. 30 seconds each. I'm going to ask one question for everybody to answer with a 30 second answer. I think it's a good question. You wait until just before the end and then you can address it. Well, I'm just before they do their summary statement, can we just finish letting okay. people, people speak? Sure. Mm -hmm. behind you? There's a person behind them. Yes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tracy Mark and I commuted from West Gloucester. Uh, and I've got interested in the affordable housing issue because I have two kids who went through a Gloucester schools, went to college. One has an advanced degree, at, but both came back and couldn't find a place to live. And this really was eye-opening for me. And um, my daughter eventually found a place in Salem. My son uh, lives at home. And as I've started to talk to more people, there are a lot more parents that have their kids at home and because they can't find a place. And we have six friends right now. A couple are living with their grandparents. And someone else is living with an uncle. They, they can't find a place. And they have professional jobs. And um, so I kind of wish that it wasn't called, we didn't use the term affordable housing. It's reasonable housing. They, you know, they're not those people. Or th these are working you know, members of Gloucester. And they've grown up here. And 
I, if they can't start, you know, have a family here, raise a family here, why, why are we going to need more school, more schools if they can't have their life in the town they grew up in? So that's, that's that. Okay, thank you. Who else um, hasn't had a chance to speak yet? Val, did you want to make a comment? So I just have a, a few stories or vignettes to add uh, in terms of discussions in the community center and around town. I, I've been involved with a Gloucester Cultural Initiative. I see some artists here. Um, artists can't find places to live and they don't make a great deal of money. So if we don't ha solve this affordable housing question, will we be an arts community going down the road? I do a lot of work with the fishing industry which is really the core of our middle class working force. If they can't afford to live here, does that mean our fishing industry goes away? Um, the, um, and then I've lived for Lan in Lanesville for a very long time and realized that uh, how many of us say our children can't afford to buy in and live here. So wherever I encounter communities of Gloucester that have historically made this a great place, a, a fishing community, an arts community, um, a, you know, multiple generations and strong neighborhoods, that this issue is undercutting the character of all that really has defined our character and culture for uh, so many generations. And but if we don't solve this, if we can't have artists live here and young families live here, uh, and fishing families live here and multiple generations, then um, we may lose a great deal in the process. One of the things that has struck me personally out here in my own experiences in Lanesville is that it took me a while to understand that we, I don't think we know fully what all these other towns are doing. Um, I was shocked to learn that you can put protection of use in your zoning ordinance. I was shocked to learn that there are towns where variances are never given, and most towns rarely give them. So we're like at an extreme in terms of variances awarded. Our zoning ordinance is not what it could be. Uh, we don't seem to be funding our affordable trust. Are we looking at our FEMA zones? Provincetown is charging more for non-residents in taxes. Rockport is looking at revising zoning because their school enrollments are going down because they can't get young families in. I think that um, it might be really worthwhile for us in Gloucester to realize that we're not the only experts. Our current ordinance is not the Bible, really, because <laughs> it can be rewritten. And um, we do, before we have final statements, I did want to say that we have a sign-up sheet out here, and please leave your name and phone number and email. If you're interested in learning about all the optional ways that we might approach this and learn from Provincetown, Nantucket, Nahant, Long Island, other coastal communities, and what they're doing to address these problems, then we may have some follow-up meetings and would welcome you um, to all of those. So. Um, you know, thank you again. And I guess we're just about, unless there's somebody else. To say that there are moratoriums, like Cape Cod at one point didn't think they had enough water to use to drink, and they didn't think they had enough water to the sewage going out. And there was a time when you couldn't build on the whole Cape Cod. We're sort of the other north, you know, the other Cape. And the same thing is true with this, which I was there yesterday, and I went out to one community. Once I went to an auction where the house was for sale with a couple of acres, but the 100 acres that went with it was delegated to be greenbelt or preserved land. So these people who bought the house for a million dollars in our 18th century beautiful cake was living within a guarded community. They were known that they would have all this land and nobody would develop it. That will protect us and keep our community the way it is. And I think what she said is really important that we should be just as strict as these other communities. Also, National Seashore is now being taken back. If people on National Seashore in Cape Cod do not have any inheritors, that land goes to the National Seashore, becomes state parks, I mean federal parks. We have two, thank we you, Elizabeth. Two, um, two people that haven't had a chance to speak yet, and then we're gonna go back to Val, have her ask her question. Hi, I'm Prudence Fish, I live in Lanesville, 
And for 30 years, Gloucester has talked about a demolition delay ordinance. The current one is stuck somewhere in the process. Maybe some of you councilors could help get it moving again. Uh, a demolition delay ordinance would be when um, a house is deemed by the Historical Commission to be preferably preserved for, for a variety of reasons. And if that's the case, it goes into a delay, maybe six months, sometimes much longer. And during that time, you try to deal with the, the seller and, and explore other avenues besides demolishing the house. You can't save them all. If at the end the seller wants to still go forward with the sale, it, it can happen and the house can be demolished. But a demolition delay ordinance would save a, a certain number of them, maybe half of them, <coughs> and, and many times they're small, modest houses. They're replaced by big McMansions. This would be just one tool that we're not using to slow down demolition, which leads to bigger houses being built on the site. Thank you. Yeah, and the character too. With change, it, it protects the character of the community. Thank you. Mary, Mary, Elizabeth, Mary Elizabeth, did you have um, oh, Mary Beth, I mean? Okay, okay. All right. Um, I think that we've already, if, since you've already spoken, could we go to Val? We're out of time, please. And um, just to maintain the agreement we had, Val. <laughs> If you want to pose your question, and then the candidates, as we promised, yeah. would have an opportunity to respond to you. That's great. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's just it's one short question. We've all approved the production housing plan. Everyone here is aware of the housing production plan. It just got approved by the state, and it's there. And I guess my, my question, which I thought would be really helpful to hear an answer maybe in two or three sentences each, just very short, is how can the city council, as a city council, how can we be proactive with that document with 10 pages of goals in the back? Just, just give us each um, two to three sentences on what you think we can do as a city councilor <coughs> to really move ahead and be proactive with some of that stuff. We so, can you share with us what that the housing plan, and if you think this is a, inappropriate, just tell me and I'll, I'll be happy to sit down. But I'm, I'm just feeling a need to kind of get, we've heard a lot, and I thought it was a fair question. What it is, it talks about all the demographics about the city, the aging community, how many houses we need at different levels. We all participated in it. Um, we had, many of us attended forums at City Hall a year and a half ago. So it's a really, it's a great community piece of work that really, lays out the things that we can be doing. So I'm just intrigued, and I think it's a fair question. So if you don't want to go through and spend the time right now, maybe in your closing remark, you could just add two or three sentences, because I think it's a real important question as we look on moving ahead. Um, we should remember that only some of the candidates have been through this process and others not, so. Val, can you say where citizens can read that plan? Where can they find it? It's it's on the website. I yep. posted it on my on my ward Facebook page. Yep. Um, I, I just want to make sure oh, everyone the, the heard that. The housing production plan. It, so, so people can go and read it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's an important document. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. And if you don't like the question, just the it's question's fine. great, but it's their choice. It's their choice how they want to respond. That's what we promised them. What they want to respond to. So uh, thank you for the question, it's an important one. And what we're going to do now is ask the candidates to uh, spend three minutes responding to what they think uh, is most important for them to focus on at this point. And I just want to say thank you to all of you for your patient listening, and thank you um, for all of you for your participation tonight. Would you like to start? Thank you. Uh, we, we were talking about pilings. And uh, some people think they're great and some people think they're terrible, but uh, I'm, I'm, I do believe that we have climate change. And I do believe, even though I don't think that uh, man is causing all of it, uh, we certainly can do something about it. And I think uh, if, the water, if the water keeps rising, we're gonna have to do something about the uh, uh, housing that's close to the water, so we may have to do pilings. 
I don't like to see us fill in any more, more marshland. And if I was going to fill in any more marshland, I'd want to do Thatcher Road and put a sidewalk down the, from, from uh, Nautilus Road down to the, to the beach because it's a very dangerous situation. Um, as I want to speak to Joel, uh, to your point, I think what you just described is the perfect business situation. Both sides think the other sides are better, and that's how you get uh, compromise, and, and that's how you make progress. If, uh, if one side thought it had all, all, it was all the way, uh, they would just not, they would stagnate. So I think when you butt heads, that's how you get things done. Um, Valerie, uh, I think you have a valid point that we should look at what other towns are doing, but um, first of all, we should decide what we, what we have here and what we want to keep here. Um, do, the, do these other things fit in the Gloucester that I grew up in and I love? And I know you need to make some changes, but I don't want to be like Manchester. I don't want to be like Ipswich. I still want to be like Gloucester. And we should take the things that will help us. Um, as a matter of fact, urban renewal, uh, I, I lived through that, and they destroyed the east end of, of Main Street, basically. It's like to cut a snake in half, and, and the tail end died. And uh, it's not like it was when I, and that's when not Main Street started going downhill. It wasn't just the malls that did it. It was the fact that they just broke everything up. And I used to shine shoes up and down that street and as a kid, and I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed talking to all the characters, you know, Dinty Moores and the uh, Red Morongs and the Gus Foots, one of the last ones we lost him, uh, rest his soul. But, I like to keep Gloucester as much like Gloucester as we can, and uh, and still and still move ahead somehow. Thank you. Um, I would love to have uh, to host a meeting here in Gloucester to talk with other communities. It it doesn't seem like we are really reinventing the wheel with um, making up new laws. If we can learn from our our sister towns and cities and see what they're doing i think that's a great idea as far as um the fema maps um I, it would be nice as planning and development to identify those locations that have high velocity zones or flood zones and then it would also be nice if fema and mema could get on the same page because fema has a set of requirements and mema is sitting there telling developers you should really up it a couple more inches you know or feet you know it's just it's get on the same page, like, make the same recommendation. Um, as far as identif or addressing the buyout option, uh, Councilor O'Hara said you know, it would be nice to stick to the ordinance and require the, the percentage. Well, the ordinance also allows for a buyout. My opinion, get rid of the buyout. Don't do it. Um, you know, and, and that's something that I, as an order, that I'm going to be filing tomorrow, hopefully. Um, but we don't need to have both. It seems silly to, to have them both. Um, second homes in the state of Massachusetts are a luxury. They are taxed above and beyond. Um, I know this from my experience of working with the treasurer's office in Rockport. Um, so the contents of a second home are taxed as a personal property tax. It's self-reporting. It's whatever the person reports that is inside their house, they get taxed on. So there is that little bit. As a local municipality, I don't know if there's something more that we could do, but again, it's something worth looking into. Obviously, Boston has it, so it would be nice to, to see what they're doing and see how they're handling it. Um, there was another comment earlier about um, attending the, the meetings. If I have a constituent that has something before P, uh, planning board or ZBA or anything, all they have to do is ask me to attend with them, either for help with a neighbor issue or if it's for advocating for them to get something forward. Um, you know, I've attended so many of those types of meetings just to learn and, and help the constituents. Thank you. Sorry, David. Uh, everyone's race very valid questions and points. We have, we have a city that's been discovered, we've talked about that. We have traffic. Obviously we're looking at 200 <coughs> units at Fuller School. Our ordinance is one point, I think 1.4, 1.5 cars uh, per family. I spoke with a, a uh, constituent, a counselor 
Orlando and I were at Maplewood School where they're going to put in 12 units. She told me that she had, she had four people in the homes. Uh, husband, husband, herself, two children. They had five cars. So we have a parking problem. Downtown, obviously, we go down there, there's no place to park. We go to the Rotary <coughs> at six o'clock in the morning. We come back in the evening, wall-to-wall -wall traffic. So we have to look at what we really want. We can't move these cars any place. We live by cars, obviously we don't have, people don't ride bicycles, horses <coughs> are gone. So we have to look at the bigger picture. I think, again, valid points as a counselor, it's making the tough decisions. We had to make a tough decision on Colburn Street. I beg people to participate in our city. It's, as a council, yes, we're representatives, but it's your city. We need you to get involved so that we can represent you. I asked people, all the, re all the uh, residents that called me pertaining to Colburn Street to come out speak. It's one thing to show up and show, show your hand, but speak, get involved. We, we represent you. You need somebody who's going to stand up for yourself, stand up for the city. I can tell you, uh, Count, uh, Attorney Favaza said as far as we're difficult, I can tell you I fought a 40-unit condominium 20 years ago in Magnolia at the old Shorecliffe Nursing Home. We, I knew nothing about city government at that point. I got involved. I was the face of the lawsuit on Gloucester Crossing. Valerie Nelson's very familiar with that. Not because I was against it, but we were spending city dollars to bring in a development. A Vernal Pond, I knew nothing about Vernal Pond. Greg Smith showed me what a Vernal Pond is. Today, we don't have that same Vernal Pond. It's much different. So you need people on the city council who are going to be leaders, who are going to have a backbone and represent you, the citizens of Gloucester. So I ask you for one of your four votes on November 7th. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming out and for their comments tonight. A lot of these things we've heard before, and some things I'm hearing for the first time, but a lot of them are obviously related to the same issues. I wish I could address all of them, and I urge anyone who doesn't get their question answered by me tonight to call me. My card, I'm down that table, it's got my phone number on it and my email address. I'd love to converse about these topics. I can assure you I'm very concerned about the mansion on Wheeler's Point because it's directly across the street from my house. I called my buddy Joel Favazza to check it out, believe it or not, completely within the zoning of the existing neighborhood. Setbacks are right, heights are right, everything is allowed. <coughs> Required very little input because he stayed within the cube, I call it, of the zone. So uh, I can promise you I'm concerned about that, I can tell you. Um, but more, more so, I heard a couple of comments that I thought we could speak directly to. One was from a, from a lady over here about outbuildings, okay? Uh, part of my uh, affordable housing zoning amendment ordinance, I'm sorry, uh, zoning amendment ordinance uh, amendments that we filed that the council passed deals with two principal buildings on the same lot. Currently, our zoning ordinance does not allow you to have two principal buildings on the same lot i.e. two buildings that people live in. Uh, the thing that I've, the, the orders that I filed that the council passed, and I'm very proud to say nine to nothing, allows if there's an existing unit in one of those outbuildings, as you put it, and it's currently not permitted because you can't have two principal buildings on the same lot, you're able to go to the, C, the ZBA and get that permit relief as long as you make that an affordable unit. It's another way to drive up our stock and use that and not overburden what we already have for parking and the like. Okay, so I, I thought that was a very interesting point. I'd like you to know that we already thought of it to a certain extent, and we're dealing with that. Um, Judge Sands actually wrote the book on a couple of these issues. The leading case from the SJC was his opinion, and he's the foremost expert on the topic, and I'm very proud that he's invited me to come speak to his class next week about the very topic. I urge you all to talk to your neighbor. He's going to have some really significant insight. Um, density. Very interesting point, density. Councillor Gilman and I, Councillor Gilman filed a, an order on uh, tiny houses. I, at the same time, was looking at ways that we could get veterans affordable housing. We had a meeting with the planning director, with the veterans uh, service director, Adam, 
uh, Kukuru. They brought in the VA to help us learn more about ways we could potentially do a tiny house veterans village. It's going to require an ordinance that we have to write about tiny house properties. Thank you. Just one, and just one more moment. Um, 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, we could go on all night about a lot of these topics. There's a lot of very important ones. The thing I would like you to focus on when you cast your vote on November 7th is who's solution-based. There's nothing worse to me than a politician that talks about problems but doesn't solve them. I'm going to be rolling up my sleeves, just like I've been doing for two years, to go out there and solve our problems together. And I also ask you for one of your four votes on November 7th. Thank you. I just want to address a couple of things that we're talking about. Uh, Patty talked about uh, the FEMA rules and uh, what council has done. A few councils have put that forward. It's going to go to the uh, planning board. And you're right. What, what are other communities doing? You know, we're not uh, inventing the wheel here. So uh, we're going to do the study. We're going to find out exactly how other co communities are, do, are dealing with the FEMA rights and being in the, in the velocity zone and, and then go <coughs> from there. Because uh, the, what we're doing now is very ambiguous and, uh, and, we, and we need to resolve it so it's clear. I, I just want to correct a couple of uh, statements that were made about the Fuller School and uh, or the Fuller Development. And uh, the, talk about a development that has full of smoke and mirrors, and that's one of them. Um, the YMCA on, on, uh, on uh, Middle Street has zero to do with uh, the Fuller Development. And I need people to understand that. And uh, they keep on throwing it out, but it has nothing to do with it. <coughs> the people that are building it, uh, the, the 200 units of Doblin Construction, Andrew Doblin, he's the one that owes this city 30 units. Either 30 units uh, on site or off site, or he has to pay the, the 30 units. And that's in our ordinance, and we're talking about the Bible. Why, you know, we keep on rewriting that when it's there. <coughs> and and, and uh, Mr. Doblin certainly knows that, that he owes us 30 units. So I hope my fellow counselors are, are with me on this. <coughs> we have to draw a line in the sand and say, you want to build here? Fine. You don't? Walk away. You know, it was, it was a, I, I feel it was a bad deal for Gloucester anyway. And uh, I'd be very happy to see him go. Um, I want to talk uh, just a, a little bit about uh, the uh, uh, I4C2. This, uh, whether you believe in God or you don't. But I think a piece of property that's been empty for 50 years, God is telling you something. <laughs> God is saying it should not be sold, it should stay in the city of Gloucester. We own very little <clears throat> property on the harbor, and I4C2 is one of those uh, few properties. So I agree with the gentleman, and I, and I certainly don't want to see that developed. I, don't want, I think that it's, we need a, a common area in town. Uh, our, our green, or where we can have uh, festivals and celebrate, and it's used well. So let's <coughs> take uh, 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 this as karma, that it doesn't need to be developed. Right? Uh, one last thing about, the, we, we're talking about taxes, and uh, there is a surcharge <coughs> that uh, if it's not your primary residence, uh, a lot of people move to Florida and then change their primary residence, then they come back and they find that their tax bill is a lot higher than, uh, than they, they left before, before they left. So the, that, is, that, that is really, really taken care of. We have a lot to do here, and we can do the research, we can make things happen. Um, I think uh, the, you know, develop, putting together a team, and a team not only that works with the mayor, and you know, we're as counselors, so the mayor proposes, we dispose. But unless the mayor proposes, we don't have anything in front of us. <coughs> we can put in a request to the mayor, it still has to come somewhere. That's the way the checks and balances works with uh, the executive branch and the legislative branch. And it's always worked well, but we have to have a team that's going to work with city staff, is going to work with the mayor, and we're going to get together <coughs> the housing uh, uh, reports. We need to dig that out and find out exactly where it is. Number five on the ballot, uh, uh, I, I just wish that uh, uh, for your vote one again, <coughs> once again. Uh, I'm going for my eighth term. I've got the experience, I've got the ability, and I have the vision. Thank you. Thank you. Good. So I'd like to address two things. The first thing is, is the Fuller School, and uh, I have a slightly different view uh, than uh, Joe just expressed, because I think the Fuller School is a tremendous opportunity for the city to 
make the sale, to get the tax revenues, to get the jobs, and to get 30 units. And we can do that. And uh, I'm uh, a negotiator by trade, and I think that we can um, negotiate a, a, a satisfactory deal for both the developer's standpoint and from the city standpoint that we actually get 30 units. And not a maybe and not the smoke and mirrors that show represented. Anything can be done by agreement, and it's our job as a city to push that agreement in, in, in a negotiation so that we get what we need. And what we need <clears throat> is the sale, the taxes, and the 30 units, and we can get that. Uh, the second thing I'd like to comment on is the FEMA zones, because I was right in the middle of a planning and development uh, subcommittee, which I chair, was in the middle of the Colburn Street um, uh, 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 um, analysis and a recommendation to the City Council. <clears throat> the one thing to remember about the FEMA um, floodplains and the velocity zones that they only regulate the bottom of, of the building, the bottom of the living space. The top of the living space is re regulated by our zoning. The applicant had come to us saying because the FEMA is making him raise the bottom that he should just raise the top. And we said, no, you don't need to raise the top. You, you need to raise the bottom. That's what but the top is going to stay at 30 feet because that's what our ordinance said and, and according to and the city council heard the neighbors and the neighborhood character argument and we said that's right. So it's not that they can't build there, which they can as long as they're within the 30 feet. Um, and I think it's, it's when we analyze a very complicated issue like the FEMA flood zones, we need to remember what it is we're analyzing, what we control, what we don't control. In that situation, the FEMA bottom of the building is for safety. The top of the building is the city's zoning ordinance. And um, we need to make sure that everybody understands that going forward because I think, again, that's how we deal with a complicated problem by analyzing its pieces. And so thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for listening to us. And uh, I appreciate one of your votes for the councilor at large. Thank you. So I absolutely support a more proactive approach to protecting housing options for the diversity of our residents and our neighborhoods. Our city is economically diverse and acting on housing now is a big indicator uh, of how our community will look even as soon as 10 years from now. Uh, according to the housing production plan, we have uh, housing opportunities here in Gloucester, and uh, even though we are in a geographically tight area, the city has examined several housing opportunity sites downtown. <laughs> I don't know if Mr. Gyllenhaal remembers, but I attended several Zoning Board of Appeals meetings when the Harbor Village site was being ironed out and, uh, and worked out. Um, I, I followed that issue very closely because it's very important to me. Uh, I'd love for the city to be able to uh, continue to look into affordable housing options uh, without any help. Uh, looking at what's going on up at the federal level, uh, I'm guessing that our budget is going to continue to be leaner and meaner over the next few years uh, as more competition rises for federal block grants and HUD money as, and as we look into the needs of our school system and infrastructure upgrades. Uh, but thankfully, here in Gloucester and on the North Shore, we have opportunities to rely on several different community organizations <coughs> who are experts in developing workforce and affordable housing creatively. Uh, for example, Action, the North Shore Community Development Coalition, Harbor Light Community Partners, uh, and others are experts in helping people live comfortably right here, right where they need to be. And we, need, we do need to get the city's workforce housing stock to be above 10% to avoid the 40B in the future, while at the same time looking into more appealing options for developers to build or rehabilitate here. And I know it is a challenge. And just from hearing your remarks tonight, that just affirms that for me. Uh, and our efforts to lift people out of poverty here continue. Uh, there are community members here in the city who have experienced developing creative housing options and I'm very grateful to hear from them uh, and I also left my literature outside uh, if you'd be interested in calling or emailing me I'd appreciate it. Uh, something that we didn't talk too too much about tonight was the live work options for artists um, and uh, that will help us sustain our cultural history. Other cities have had success with it, notably Lowell, which admittedly has huge old mill buildings that they were able to turn into live workspace, but we really need to take a good look at that here. Uh, if I'm elected, 
I would love to dig into the zoning and building ordinances in collaboration with, because certainly I'm a nurse, I'm, I need help uh, figuring that stuff out, uh, but from, with the community development and planning departments, uh, the Gloucester Housing Authority, the boards involved, the Affordable Housing Trust, uh, and my fellow counselors. So as a visiting nurse, I see people from all walks of life, uh, from all different communities on the North Shore and in the Merrimack Valley, from Marblehead to Lawrence, and I know their struggles. I know how to advocate on their behalf, and I will advocate on our behalf as well. The time to act on workforce and affordable housing is now. I'm here to help. I appreciate one of your four votes on November 7th. Thank you. 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 Thank you.